absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the original Mini is a truly iconic car. It sits in such rarefied company as the Ford Model T, the Citroen 2CV and the Volkswagen Beetle as being one of those cars that truly mobilised the masses. It was the product of the 1950s and yet became the symbol of the swinging 60s. It was in production for just over 40 years, spanning more or less six decades. It is genuinely one of the all-time greats. But it's also a car that I've never really been in love with. I feel like that requires proper explanation and proper explanation is going to be a little bit of a story. If you're just here for the review of this car, then you want to skip ahead to this time code. Alright, you want a bit of a story? Fine. The Mini is a car that's meant quite a bit to a few people in my family. My sister's first proper car that she actually fell in love with was a Mini. My father had a Mini van back in the 1980s and he absolutely adored it. And my mother had a Mini Red Hot which she had to sell when she could no longer fit my pram in the back of it. To this day she'll still tell me that it only cost a fiver to fill that car. More recently my father owned a 1966 Mini Cooper. Beautiful car, red with a black roof. I was tasked with taking some photographs of it. So I went to the storage unit where the car was, uh, got in it and tried to start it. Unfortunately, because it hadn't run for a little while, it didn't really want to stay running. That, that, that's fine, I, I knew at the time how to use a choke and, and things like that. This was a good 10 years ago. So I got the car running, but then I needed to move it. Now, if you let the revs die, the car would conk out. Normally, not really a problem, except those early minis did not have a synchro mesh in first, which meant that every time I moved forward, it would crunch. However, the Mini also had a bit of a problem, which is that it wanted to pop out of first gear. Not necessarily an issue. This was exacerbated by the fact that I was moving uphill on a gravel driveway. So, what I tried to do was move it forward. You had to keep the revs up, crunch the poor thing into first, then you would spin the wheels, you'd move about five yards down the road, and it would pop out again. So I got in this thing, was going, I drove the car a sum total of about 40 feet, swore at it quite a bit, and then decided that I had had enough of minis. That's not to say that I really ever had any more experience beyond that, and I have a real love for the more modern one, but I thought it was important that you understand that before we got onto the review proper. The problem with popular cars is that of course they are much loved, but there are plenty of people out there who want to own one, but want something a little bit more special. And that's where DeVille came in. It was the product of Harold Radford, a Rolls-Royce dealer in London in the 1960s, but decided to offer a service to his clients, much like he did for Rolls-Royce and Bentley, of customization. And that means if you were a man about town in the 60s, your Mini could stand out. This is not an original Radford. It is a loving tribute to those cars created by the Mini Center in Shrewsbury. It's a 2000 Rover Mini, meaning it's one of the very last of line, and it has just 7,453 miles on the clock. It is certainly in immaculate condition, and when I saw it filming the other day, I just knew that I had to take it out because I thought that the Mini and I had unfinished business. I don't know what colour the car was originally, but it's now sporting this beautiful silver and grey two-tone paintwork. It looks utterly stunning. The little 13-inch wheels, those flared arches, the whole thing is just sheer perfection. On the interior, you have all this lovely metalwork. You have these big, chunky, grey leather Recaro seats, which are very nice, but they do rather fill out the interior. It's an odd thing to drive. It will be, of course, no surprise to anyone that's ever driven a classic Mini before, but I do feel rather like someone's put this car in a wash that's a little bit too hot. 
I feel somewhat cramped. My legs and knees are trying to turn the steering wheel at all times. And when I try and brake, I'm touching the other end of the steering column. However, there's certainly some good things. That little 1.3 litre fuel injected engine may be the descendant of the original 1950s lump, but it's pretty smooth. It's reasonably quiet, perhaps a little too quiet for my liking, and it pulls well enough. The four-speed manual gearbox, and I cannot recall the last time I drove a car with a four-speed manual, is actually not too bad. If you do things at its pace and not try and rush it, it's actually quite nice. The car's actually reasonably comfortable. No doubt these seats are a large part of it because I went over a teeny tiny pothole earlier and it feels like the entire thing wants to split in half. The sunroof is very much appreciated and helps make this cockpit feel somewhat airy and I just cannot imagine how people ever use this for family transport. That being said, the boot is surprisingly capacious. I've got both of my bags in there, which isn't always easily done on some of the more unusual cars that I test drive. The steering, of course, is unassisted, and although this big old chunky looking wheel seems a little bit out of place in a classic looking Mini, it's got plenty of feedback coming through it. Pretty sure this car needs a wheel rebalancing because it's just, there's just a, a little wobble in it, but otherwise it drives quite nicely. Something like this, I'd be very tempted to make it a little bit racier and, and sportier and, and pep it up, but it is actually very pleasant indeed. The dash in here is this lovely little turned aluminium look with these chrome surrounded dials. Very nice to see proper dials in a car as well. In fact, the major criticism of this car in terms of refinement is the wind noise. Uh, there is a heck of a lot of it, but I can't really count that against the car, can I? No. sound quite fruity as you get up to about 5,000 rpm. The red line is indicated at about 6 but it seems to have absolutely zero interest in getting there. I must confess I'm far, far from a Mini expert, this being the only one that I've really driven. And I did do some research and this engine could be putting out anywhere from about 60 to 100 horsepower. I suspect it's at the lower end of that scale. If I'm being completely honest, it doesn't feel that punchy when you get on it. But for cruising around town and for having a bimble, it is adequate. It is perfectly adequate. Now everybody's always telling me that it's this kind of road that is absolutely perfect for appreciating the charms of a small British classic like this. So let's turn around, try and ditch this traffic and find out. It's not fast, it's not fast at all, but look, there's a smile. I'm driving a Mini and I'm smiling. Yeah, all right, fair play. Now let's talk prices, 25,000 pounds. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for a 20 year old Mini, granted, but this is also an immaculate car. I have no doubt whatsoever that you could easily spend that sum on a classic Mini. Personally, I'd like this to be a, a little bit fruitier. I'd probably leave the suspension and everything alone. I just want it to sound quicker. I don't even need it to be quicker. I just want it to sound a, a little bit peppier. But otherwise, if I was gonna buy a Mini, I'd have it like this. I'm not that fussed about the fact that it's a very late one, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there who don't consider this a, a real Mini in much the same way there's a lot of people that argue about which Porsche, of course, is the, the authentic and the correct one to have, but 
this is the experience that I hoped that I would get. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. I had unfinished business with the Mini. And I am so, so glad that I decided to finish it. The brakes need a firm press to do their best, but they seem more than adequate at stopping the car. The more you use it, the better and better that gear shift becomes. You very quickly become at one with the chassis, and I can see very much how people could throw these things around a racetrack because they are very communicative chassis. They are very fun. They're so small, you've got a huge choice of lines, even on a narrow country road like this. And the whole thing just kind of gives me the experience that I'm after. If you'd like more details about this car, please do check out Total Head Turners. I'll put the link to their website in the description below. Thanks to them for lending it to me. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.